<laughs> right, welcome, uh, welcome everyone, welcome all our visitors and to the press, etc. And we also would need to welcome Paul, our new councillor. Um, Paul, you're quite, I'm quite happy for you to come up to the table and sit. Um, obviously, you can't vote or you can't speak, but you can come up and um, sit. We have to square you in in a week's time. But, uh, Thank you. Uh, welcome. Thank you, Chair. Um, we have a... I have an approach from um, Cathy who would request and like all the women, uh, female members, councillors, to meet at lunchtime to have a photo for suffrage week, if that's all right, over the lunch break. So Maybe to take just outside the table. Thank you. Mm. Okay, so she'll follow that up. And the other thing that we want to note is, is Nathan, uh, Nathan Allen, where's Nathan? Nathan's moving on today to uh, better and, and, and greater things by being the local board. <laughs> Easy to And in West Auckland. So <coughs> welcome, uh, uh, farewell Nathan, thank you for all your work and, and then welcome to uh, West Auckland Ward scenario. Okay, apologies. So we have apologies from uh, Member Terence Honick and Councillor Mike Lee for absence and Councillor Filipina for absence on council business. And we've got no other apologies I'm aware of. Um, I will actually, in case I actually vacate the chair, be aware because I'm just really not well. Um, I've got a bit of a virus, so if that happens, um, please accept my apologies as well. Dears Lee is more than aware. Okay, so uh, move, I'll move those Happy apologies. Second. second by Councillor Walker. All those in favour? Aye. Okay, any declarations of interest from anyone? <coughs> no. There are no petitions. <coughs> and public input. And we have... Um, confirmation of the minutes. Oh, sorry, confirmation of the minutes. Skipped over that. So could someone... Councillor Simpson and Councillor yep. Cashmore. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. <coughs> right, public input. Um, we have now six... Uh, speakers and public input and apologise again, there's a little bit of confusion yesterday is, in that it speak. was really Empire Capital was the only entity that went formally through to Democracy Services who were aware and so we had a bit of confusion with all the other groups who had sent emails to everyone as we know but actually Sandra wasn't aware so anyway all is good, we had a last minute um, rescue of the situation. So we are going to hear from David, uh, the two Davids from Empire Capital, and then we're going to hear from Paul Glass, Robert Elsop Smith, June Kearney, and Evan Ewan uh, Little, and then Richard Steele in that order. <coughs> um, just be aware, because this has already gone through the planning committee, and we're here, and we know you didn't, and couldn't um, present at that time, we're aware, but it is five minutes, so be precious with your time, and we have an annoying bell that will go off at four minutes to give you a minute to go, so we're going to be fairly tight. And for all of those people who are making the public input, just please remember that you're only speaking to the second part of the resolution that came from the planning committee, which says, recommend to the Finance and Performance Committee not to proceed with the sale of any marina land pending the completion of the work referred to in Clause A above, which is a workshop to discuss the strategy and full plan, so we're aware of that. Welcome. Please introduce yourself. Uh, good morning, Mr Chairman. My name is David Borson, and with me is <coughs> David Hollingsworth, our group CEO. Um, Mr Chairman, statutory board members, councillors, Mr Mayor, Deputy Mayor, um, thank you for having us here today. Empire Capital is an investment group privately held, and we own and, and manage investment interests around marine and marine um, land associated with that. Of particular note will be our three marinas, which are Bayswater on the North Shore, Beach, um, Pine Harbour at Beachlands and Hobsonville Marina out west in terms of our three marinas that we primarily look after there. We're a well experienced and well established operator in the, at that marine space. In addition to our marinas, we have considerable land assets on the landward side of the water as well. Our marinas were generally conceived um, in the 1970s um, and early 80s, and as spaces, sorry, and as spaces, they were generally pretty utilitarian in design for boat parking, car parking associated with those using the boats, and included in some cases service areas for the maintenance of those boats. 
Historically, the areas have been poorly maintained and by today's standards, relatively undeveloped. Today, the people of Auckland need and expect more from these spaces. These spaces need investments to deliver this development and public transport outcomes to, en to enable placemaking and also to facilitate the ongoing growth of Auckland. And this is to service a wider community than just the community of birth holders that have traditionally used these spaces. We recognise that the marinas are not a priority area for council investment, but council can achieve this investment of the desired outcomes for placemaking and public transport with <coughs> and through appropriate entities associated with each of the sites. Um, we would suggest that the Finance and Performance Committee should acknowledge the resolution of the Planning Committee in a manner that it sees appropriate but be equally clear to the committee that the proposed strategy should not impact upon the value of the council's current assets or the current income streams that they generate for the <coughs> council. In doing so, council should be particularly mindful of seeking to generate further income for council. Where possible and where suitable, seek the release <coughs> of capital in accordance with council's own strategic documents at either of the LTCCP 10 year annual plan or even annual plan basis to generate that income that's expected there in accordance with its own current policies and to ensure that wider public transport and placemaking initiatives are achieved simultaneously. And in addition, there is opportunities to deliver new homes for Auckland as well. The right partnership out outcomes can achieve this and it needs a strategy that deals with all stakeholders, not just the limited numbers that have put their hands up to date. Marina births are held by a very small number of private individuals. Council's own significant strategy would indicate that it's a relatively straightforward strategy to develop. One that protects asset values, delivers placemaking, and delivers public transports and homes. And that can be done within the existing <coughs> framework of the Auckland plan, the, Auckland, the annual budget, and the unitary plan. And, and, and from our perspective, we would seek that you would encourage Panuku to continue on a business as usual approach to deliver the financial outcomes that council has been seeking for these spaces and also the additional benefits of placemaking and public transport. Happy to take any questions. Oh, that was perfect. Four minutes. Thank you. <laughs> right. Well, we have uh, Councillor Newman and Councillor Wayne Walker. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> could I just ask? What is your understanding of what Parliament intended when it passed the Empowering Acts and how should those Empowering Acts be treated in the context of the development proposals that you suggest? Um, the Empowering Acts are, are very different at each of the marinas. For example, Pine Harbour, our, our marina there, there is no Empowering Act, so it's a non-issue. At Hobsonville, um, the Empowering Act was an enabling piece of legislation to allow for that to happen. Um, in a planning sense, it was what was required at the time, post the Town and Country Planning Act. Um, and now we move into an environment where we see we are now under RMA as the suitable statute for all that planning. So it was an enabling framework, and we now have an RMA framework that supersedes it from our argument. We've shared with councillors our planning advice on that um, from our lawyers on, on that matter. Um, I, I think to go one step further, there is also references within the Enabling Act that recognises the need to give effect to and not limit the, um, the application of other um, acts in terms of that land. Uh, that, that act, th those statutes still apply. Parliament has not rescinded those Question. statutes. Question. I'm just talking to these people. Yep. So if those acts do apply, uh, how can we... Um, move forward with your proposals, notwithstanding what Parliament intended? Um, I, I suppose there's differences of opinions about how those acts have been interpreted. Um, I think if we looked at some parallels around the Auckland waterfront, if you look from here, effectively from here down to the waterfront from here, there is a significant amount of reclaimed land, reclaimed under an enabling acts for port purposes. That's now we see Wynyard Quarter. Now that's obviously not a port purpose, it was enabled to establish land but it's recognising over time land use has changed and it was about enabling it. Once you've now got it, you have a framework which is the RMA that provides for the change in, in land use. 
Worst case scenario, we're very happy to work with council to look at whether or not, if it is a roadblock that you see, as we go back for a very simple omnibus change of legislation, if you see it as a roadblock, um, to have it removed. Okay, thank you. Councillor Walker. Yeah. Well, um, have some familiarity with the plans at, um, at Hobson Hall. Um, how long has Empire Capital been liaising with uh, Panuku about the plans for apartments on the waterfront at Hobson Hall? Um, sorry, predates me some of that involvement. Conversations um, between council and various owners of Hobsonville Marina have been taking place going back as far back as 2004, 2005, 2006. Um, Empire Capital acquired what was West Park Marina in 2013. Uh, prior to that, uh, maybe 12 months before that, the then owners uh, wrote to council um, expressing an interest to buy the freehold interest in the various lots and that conversation was carried on by Empire Capital after the transaction took place. Okay, thank you. And, and the second question, it's just a really a follow-on, uh, how long has um, Empire Capital been uh, liaising with council planners around your plans for apartments on the waterfront at Hobson Hall? Uh, that would be around uh, four or so years, about 2014, as, as once we expressed the interest with council to carry on, with those conversations, council or Panuku brought in um, their parties from the planning perspective to talk about the, the process and what Panuku would like to see in terms of public outcomes. Just for clarification, that was Panuku's planners, that wasn't the regulatory planners at council. Okay, and I guess just a quick follow on question, at, at what point did the community become aware of the plans for um, apartments at Hobsonville, the waterfront? in terms of uh, general community or council. Uh, my understanding is uh, a local committee was presented with a workshop in mid-2016 or thereabouts. Apartments were clearly signalled though as part of the unitary plan process as well. Thanks. <coughs> Councillor Watson. Oh, th thanks, uh, thanks uh, David, uh, both Davids. Uh, just, uh, just in terms of your a recommendation that Panuku continue with their business as, as usual model. You're aware that you've been through a public engagement process at West Park, um, Hobsonville, in which you know you were you were front and centre. Your personnel were in there delivering your plans you'd put up. They they were pretty overwhelmingly rejected by the local community, not not just birth holders, but residents, public transport patrons and, and, and indeed the same pattern that's repeated at Gulf Harbour. Why, why do you think, given that you've had a free shot and really backed up by Panuku, there hasn't been any, uh, no real public response to that? In fact, it's been overwhelmingly one of opposition. Oh, I believe there's an opportunity here. This is the start of the conversation. Um, we have been through the process with the community and started that conversation. We've got some very clear feedback. Um, one of the particular issues there was height. There was obviously some very misleading information put out there on height. Now, if we address the height issue, we might see a very different response. <coughs> it also comes down to what is the detailed design and configuration of the site and any development that is to be realised there as well. Um, we had some very people very concerned that they were going to lose views. Um, and as we're all aware of, views are something that's not protected under the RMA. And we have a framework at Hobsonville that has enabled development to a particular height. We haven't seek to breach that height and now we need to en engage in a conversation of perhaps as what is a suitable height, perhaps lower than what's previously been determined by the unitary plan. Okay, thanks. And just a quick follow up, Mr Chair. And, and you would see that uh, in terms of uh, the, the, the business as usual approach adopted by Panuku that um, apartments on the waterfront uh, could be processed as a, as a public work for which the council has uh, <coughs> control um, or financial responsibility then, do you? Um, that's a preference that um, Panuku has expressed as to use the Public Works Act. We're quite happy to go through a more robust process of uh, <coughs> people see this legislation as a roadblock of looking for a means to get 
through that, we are happy to go back through the longer route of having the Act repealed if, if people deem that necessary. Um, it is as recognising is that we have a unitary plan that expects a certain level of growth on site. That is not a new plan, uh, say, and that plan echoes a lot of the development that was anticipated under the Waitakere plan in terms of the only change here was a little bit of addi additional height in terms of the activities that could happen here. Um, worst case scenario, are we looking at leasehold development as opposed to freehold development? Our preference is clearly to pursue freehold because the market understands freehold property better than what it does understand leasehold property. Councillor Darby. Uh, thank you. Thank you, David. Um, at Bayswater Marina, um, which I've had a lot long involvement with, where you have fee simple title over the, what's called the new reclamation, which is directly adjacent to the historic reclamation, which is under the asset register of Auckland Transport. Uh, I've urged um, collaboration between your entity, Empire Capital, and Auckland Transport, and hopefully with Panuku guiding Auckland Transport, to get a more cohesive and more efficient use of this finite coastal land. And I, I guess I'm addressing uh, not duplicating roads into it, not duplicating car park where unnecessary, and actually sharing these valuable assets while promoting much improved public transport where we're isolated at the moment on your, on your particular part, uh, boat ramp access, promenades, um, parklands, etc. Can you outline um, what the progress is in getting that more holistic through Certainly, approach. Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, we have been through um, repetitive, um, an ongoing process of discussion around design of a master plan. That master plan has not been just for our site. It's encompassed, encompassed the whole of the reclamation, both the old and the new, but also extended that to um, include some of the adjacent council reserves, um, both in Nataringa Bay and also further north into Shoal Bay to look at that total master plan for the site. Um, we have had ongoing discussions with Auckland Transport. Um, unfortunately, due to their budgetary constraints, that's been us leading a lot of that process. We have simultaneously released consultants to work for them on landscaping matters and also traffic manager matters so that they could be considered in an integrated manner. Um, in terms of some of that detailed planning, we have looked very carefully and <coughs> In terms of that, we recognise that there's no point in us both duplicating roads coming into the site and it specifically looked at enabling Auckland Transport to bring buses, et cetera, access through for the park and rides, et cetera, through our sites to, in terms of facilitate that. I suppose that's hinged around a, a concept of a main street and in terms of that, from a, from a master planning level, we're actually looking at built form. Um, whilst the current Auckland um, transport designation doesn't provide for development. The urban planning um, ADO has been quite keen for us to sort of explore what are some potential options for further development of that space as well, um, recognising longer term that a car park may not be the best use for that space. Um, we've had to carefully balance that with our own requirements. Um, we are first and foremost a marina. We have a number of boats parked there. We have a number of berth holders. Berth holders need to have car parking associated with, with those berths, and so that's been something that we've very carefully maintained. I alluded to one of the bullet points in my presentation is that whilst these spaces have been very utilitarian, car parks have been shaped and formed as car parks for a large part of the year. They are currently vacant, and that's just a reflection of how frequently some of the berth holders go boating. Now, at that stage, those spaces can be reshaped to shared spaces that can still function as a car park, but look and feel quite differently to actually provide a lot of additional amenity um, along the water's edge for that. Um, we have done a master plan that provides for ball walks. Um, we've taken upon what was successfully delivered at West Haven and really lifted that up another level um, to provide for that interest. And we've shown that there's potential for that to extend around Auckland Transport site there as well. Now, to be fair to Auckland Transport, their focus has been about where do they park cars, um, and we are pushing them to deliver the, the full public um, outcomes that you would expect here for the whole peninsula, not just our part of the site. Okay, thanks for the update. Um, if I could uh, add to that, the relationship with Auckland Transport is very important to the Empire Capital Group. Um, further to what David has mentioned about Bayswater, it's also played a substantial role in what is potential at Hobsonville Marina. Um, 
an open part of the process has been to provide land uh, to be made available for parking um, to ease congestion on Clearwater Cove in particular. Um, a substantial number of the um, negative survey responses was about the congestion on Clearwater Cove and the lack of parking and that is something that we've been actively working with Auckland Transport over probably 18, 24 months to try and address. And I suppose just to complete the discussion, at Pine Harbour we've recently got consents for a development and as part of that actually facilitates again bringing the public bus service into the marina so we can actually get buses again meeting ferries. At the moment there isn't a bus stop currently planned or proposed and so we're providing that in terms of part of our development <coughs> as, as that redevelopment happening there as well. All right. Yep, right. Well, oh, sorry. Yep. Yep. Thanks, thanks, Mr. Chair. Oh, sorry. Gents, I'm glad to hear about the buses going down to Pine Harbour because the, no matter what we do with the, pub, the ferries, which are a very, very popular mode of commute, um, we're not going to be able to create enough car parking spaces. So the PT is a very crucial option. My question to you is about your liaison with your stakeholders. So the first ones are your um, birth holders. Yep. So what sort of formal stakeholder relationships do you have with them? The second is with the wider community, so there is a more joined up level of understanding between the groups. Yep. Um, I suppose that's a, a work in progress, it's an area that we can Im improve. Um, each of our three marina managers has regular meetings with each of the, uh, the birth holders associations. I think that's an important voice though that we have to recognise is that the birth holders associations only represent a, a, a portion of our birth holders. There are more birth holders in our marinas that are non-members than actually members. So just reflecting that voice um, across that. We have periodically in the past done surveys of our members to get feedback on various matters and we have that ongoing feedback in terms of that process. The wider community, that is something that we have to be quite careful about. Um, we are sometimes in a catch-22 of if we present too much information, it's deemed to be a fait accompli. If we don't present enough com information, um, people are saying, well, why haven't you presented enough? You, you can't win in terms of some of that, that element through there. Um, and then that's a process that we're working through there. There's, um, <coughs> excuse me, been a lot of um, consultation where we've been able to with um, birth holders and, and the wider community. The, the interesting part with um, Hobsonville <coughs> is that there was somewhat a chicken and egg scenario. At the point of discussions we're at, um, there hasn't been an offer to sell the freehold interest, so it's premature whether you go to the wider community. Um, with any plans, etc., if you don't even know if something's going to be made available to yourself. We were having a conversation with Parnuka at Hobsonville about could we have a conversation about buying the marina. So you're having a conversation about a conversation that might happen in the future. At what stage are you actually engaging with the public in any meaningful way if you don't actually know what you're, you're discussing at that stage? It, it's a, it's a with, bit of a tension. Um, uh, with the Hobsonville Booth Old Association, that is a very well established. Um, entity, probably uh, 12, 13 years old. Um, certainly uh, they have been made aware at committee level that the owner of the marina was engaging with Panuku to purchase the freehold interest. Um, it's, uh, it's not been held as a, a secret. Um, some 18 months ago, uh, I think we had a meeting with the tenants at Hobsonville Marina um, explaining that we were having these conversations and as part of uh, the discussions, we were looking to increase the size of the marine services area out there, going from some 16,000 square metres to 19,000 square metres. Um, the whole idea was to, um, to give those tenants security of tenure. Um, they've got businesses and, and they wish to um, stay for a long time. The Bayswater Association is uh, not as old, maybe four or so years old. Um, the birth holders at Bayswater, by way of their trustee and birth licences, have an annual general meeting and uh, potential plans for development um, have been presented at those annual general meetings uh, for a number of years, maybe six, seven, eight years. Um, the Pine Harbour Association is the, the youngest of the three, possibly only about three years old. Um, and. Uh, communication with them has been through their committee level and through uh, newsletters that are regularly sent out to, to birth holders. Great, so work in progress. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. 
Impact Capital um, have obviously made a major investment in the master planning, as you've explained to us today. Um, do you consider that the council plans supersede parliamentary statute? I mean, it's it's quite something to have put that amount of investment into the planning and everything you've described to us. Uh, you must be relatively <coughs> confident of your position. So I'm I'm just interested in what yep. advice you've received. So we've done different levels of planning at, at each of the marinas. Um, obviously, we're significantly further ahead in the process <coughs> at Pine Harbour, where we've gone through a fully notified consent process, had a hearing, we've been granted consent. At Bayswater, um, again, we're at the master planning level. We have put significant um, sums of money into that master planning work, and we are working through that process. At Hobson Bull, it's a, it's a, a much lesser level, and that is because we have this uncertainty. Um, we don't even know at this stage in terms of have we actually got a a mandate from Council to Parnuku to whether or not they can engage with us around this co conversation of divestment. Um, obviously, um, there is a risk. We do have to spend some money and actually create some of this information so that people can understand um, what we're looking to develop. And I say our legal advice is, is that it, it shouldn't be a barrier in terms of what we're trying to achieve to work through it. Um, but again, we're also comfortable that there are other options that, that we can work through to achieve the outcome that we're, we're looking for here ultimately in terms so of So you, you understand it's a risk? Yes, we do, yep. Councillor Hills, I think that might almost wrap it up. Oh, yeah, through Chair. Just a, a few questions. So when, obviously, you're talking about Hobsonville was the West Harbour. Um, some people get confused. Um, the, <coughs> the proposed development or apartments that you might want to build, they are currently planned to be at or below the height you're allowed to build buildings at now? That is correct, yep. And with, so the biggest issue that I hear is around the access to buses and an improvement of the ferry terminal. Yep. Do you, is that, if there is any um, development, that is your priority to improve that or improve oh, access? We see the, the two happening simultaneously. Um, to just deliver a bus service and a bus car park, it needs more than that in terms of place making, <coughs> access to the waterfront, etc. That all needs to come with a, a level of investment. Um, what we're proposing is through a partnership with council is that we can invest the money to deliver those public spaces and those public good outcomes that simultaneously release and unlock land for us to develop and also develop some of these public transport outcomes. Um, from the material that we've presented publicly, we've always said that we would do all those public good outcomes first and then once we've delivered those, we'd then look at, at, at release, unlocking the land for ourselves in terms of any to get deal that we'd look to do with Parnuku on that basis. And that really provides surety um, for the public and yourselves is that you are getting the public good outcomes um, delivered up front. So see the boardwalk, see the public spaces, see public car parks formed and vested with council, and then at that stage we've always said that's when we'd look to do development um, beyond that. So there's a real certainty that the outcomes are delivered up front. Okay, and you'd be protecting all use of, for the marina holders, like the bird holders? Um, if you look at a, a very simplistic level, we have a marina, which is a space to park boats, we're not touching the water space, and so that, therefore we're not affecting <coughs> the berths themselves. Um, from there, we need berth holders need to have car parking. We have said we're going to relocate the car parking, but there's a very clear message in terms of where we're putting that car parking. It's not that much further. Yes, we acknowledge there is some walking, but they will have to walk a little bit further. Um, beyond that, you look at the services that we offer in terms of our, the marine service industry that we have down there. The discussions we've had to date with Parnuku has been around actually extending the area that they occupy to increase the level of services that we could have there. And in addition to that, delivering these outcomes for additional public car parking down there. There is one loser in this whole equation because how do you squeeze all this into that amount of area? And at the moment we have one area that is set aside for trailer boat parking and it's trailers that people uh, nine, eighty percent of them, uh, just the trailers are stored there, boats are stored elsewhere, and uh, that's just a, a land use function. They could be stored with us, um, albeit they could be stored up at Hobsonville and some of the industrial land there, or they could be stored at home in somebody else's driveway. It's just a convenient use for the, for the land through there. There's no strategic reason for those trailers to be stored on site. As we develop um, at Hobsonville, there are other activities that have, there is some unintended 
benefits there, so you might or might not be aware of that at the moment. The public car park comes Saturday, Sunday, is used for boat and trailer car parking um, for the recreational community that uses the boat ramp. Obviously, as we extend the public car parking, we see that there's real scope there to actually increase the facilities for trailer parking come weekend. There's obviously a nice symbiotic relationship there between the, the trailer parkers at the weekend and, and public transport users during the week in terms of the two peaks working together quite well. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, through you. Thank you. Um, and thank you for your um, presentation. Um, I can't get past the uh, Empowering Act. Yep. Um, and so I'm interested in your <coughs> thoughts around, um, or just if you could clarify, are you seeking to revoke this legislation? And, and um, because my experience is where Parliament wants to enable development, they will put forward a development enabling act, such as what they tried to do at Point England Reserve. So, yeah, would you please clarify how we are supposed to get past this empowering act and the intent of that? Yep, uh, I, yep. I, I suppose that's where we see is that our advice is slightly different to the advice that councils received to date, is that we don't see the empowering act a, as being this obstacle, but should it need to, we are quite happy to work through and talk to the parliament about whether or not they need to change the act or enable the act. I suppose the difference between ourselves and say Point England is the scale of which we're operating and the number of homes that we, we can only deliver 200 homes down at the marina. We can't get the, uh, the, the much <coughs> more substantial number that you're seeing at Point England in terms of that process. But if that's the route we have to go through to give everybody comfort, we're quite willing to work through that process to do so. Right, well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. You're quite full, and thank you, thank David. You. And David, and you're welcome to stay, quite obviously. And we will move a group um, vote of thanks thank to you. all the presenters. So, Jeez, um, thank you. Don't feel left out. So, we're going to have Paul is going to come forward <coughs> from the Bayswater Berth uh, holders. I suppose one thing, given that there's five um, effectively Berth Holders Association Marina users, if you can come up with a different angle yeah. for each of you rather than Never enough. repeating the same thing. <laughs> I'm sure you can do that, Paul. We'll, we'll do our best. Um, thank you very much for, uh, for your time this morning. Um, so I'm Paul Glass and I represent uh, the Bayswater Berth Holders Association. Uh, even though Bayswater uh, Marina is unfortunately in <coughs> private ownership, we strongly endorse the recommendations of the Planning Committee. Voting is part of the very fabric of Auckland life. We have one of the best natural harbours in the world for water sports, and marinas in particular are the jewel in Auckland's crown. We are very supportive of developing a comprehensive strategy that recognises the importance of marinas as a key strategic recreational boating asset, and also realises the opportunity for community placemaking. Our boating community is definitely keen to be involved in the setting of the strategy and believe this uh, matter is far too important to be left to property speculators. Property developers will tell you that you need to be rushed in your de deliberations, but this is simply not the case. There is no burning platform. They are simply trying to maximise their personal gain through property development. For the marinas that are now in private hands, the developers paid value for them on the basis of their use as marinas. They are now seeking to maximise their personal profits by seeking an alternative usage, and that is residential apartments. And the marinas are not failed assets with declining usage. There is, a, there is a significant shortage of marina berths in Auckland, there are huge waiting lists, and the problem is only going to get much worse. Now you really need to understand, once the amenity value of marinas has been destroyed, it can never be recovered. If I could just give you two very quick examples um, of why we need to proceed carefully with developing a marina strategy, and these, these, these are just things that, that, that I came across in the last couple of weeks. Uh, so last week I was just down at Bayswater, came across an old couple in their 80s uh, you know, with their canes and bits and pieces. Um, they were unloading their gear to go boating uh, at Bayswater. They were utilising the drop-off zone uh, next to the pier to unload their gear and then parked right beside it. Um, I just thought they were a, a fantastic sort of promotional couple almost for us because they clearly couldn't walk very far. So I asked if I could take a, a photo and they, they just explained to me their, their love of boating. 
Um, if we don't get the marina strategy right, they would not be able to, to vote in future, as the car park will be an apartment block and they will be parking a very long way away. Uh, now, my own boat came out of the, uh, so I'm at Bayswater, but um, there, there aren't facilities at Bayswater for taking a boat out of the water. So my boat came out of the water at Hobsonville for its summer service uh, this Monday. There are very few options around Auckland where it can be serviced now. It got lifted out of the marina on a uh, travel lift. The boat alone weighs just under 30,000 uh, kilos, plus you've got this enormous travel lift. So it's, it's, it's a very sort of industrial type setting. The boat was water blasted on the, uh, the ramp, then carried across the uh, car park, um, incidentally, where the apartments are, are planned to go in. Um, so carried right across this car park. Um, it's a very noisy process. It's a very hazardous process. Uh, there's anti-fouling then done, which, which involves um, poisonous chemicals. Um, and it, it's very hard to sort of comprehend how a, an apartment block could be sitting right in the middle of all that. Um, what we're going to experience is uh, reverse um, sens sensitivity because there's no feasible way that uh, you, know, you could have kids, dogs and people running around these boats as they're being moved and, uh, and worked on. So in summary, I would ask you not to rush into any decisions relating to Auckland's great marinas. Please, please do develop a long-term strategy that secures the uh, future for such an important part of life in the city of Sales, and we would be delighted to be constructively involved in that process. Thank you, Paul. Another perfect four minutes. <laughs> Questions of Paul? Uh, Councillor Darby and then Councillor Walker. Paul, you'll be familiar with the entry plan provisions, I say Bayswater, which are quite deliberately written to uh, ensure that public access is protected, public transport is protected, there are open spaces that are set aside. Can you explain what you get, what you think you'd get in a strategic approach to marinas or strategy versus the unitary plan, which is absolutely confirmed, no appeals on that particular part. So what is the difference? What do you get that, particularly Bayswater, that is different? I think the, the issue that we've got is that um, there, there's the unitary plan, which, which, which you know, we support, and I, I should really stress we are not anti-development in any way, and then we actually see sort of the practical outcomes. So at Bayswater, it's very hard for us to comment at this stage because in spite of what's been said, um, we have yet to see any details. Um, so we haven't seen a master plan as yet. Hopefully something is, is coming out shortly. Um, but there has been nothing for us to really sort of be consulted on as yet or focus on, so we don't know <coughs> exactly what it's going to look like. Um, but if we look across at uh, Pine Harbour or the proposal for Hobsonville Marinas, uh, it's really quite concerning. So, you, you know, I can understand why developers want to build their buildings right up hard against the, the water because that's going to maximise their, their, their profits. Uh, but in terms of a functioning marina, um, it's a little bit of a disaster. Um, you know, if you can't get easy access to boats because you're arriving with typically car loads of quite heavy gear, um, you need to get, uh, be able to get onto your, your, your drop-off zones, um, trundlers, get down to your boats. Um, uh, it, it, it just, I guess it just destroys an amenity value of what is a, re a really a functioning asset. Um, but it's very hard to comment specifically on Bayswater because as yet we haven't seen any plans for it. Yeah. Um, we understand there might be up to sort of 400 apartments going in there, so it's, it's going to be very interesting to see how you can have that sort of um, amount of development going on inside something that's a very well-functioning marina currently. It, it feels like there's going to be quite a big give up for the, the people who actually use the, the marina in favour of, uh, of residential dwellings. So you, you think it's a well-functioning marina? Because I, I view it as, as pretty much a car park on reclaimed seabed. Uh, and I, like, I would like to see much greater public good outcomes there which are provided through the unitary plan. You, th you think it's currently a well-functioning marina? I, I do, and I guess this is something that we should really stress. I think a lot of people, you know, when they see sort of golf courses, um, just just see sort of empty space rather than, um, than than something that provides, you know, a facility for the community. 
when people look at marinas, um, people who are not boaties often just see sort of a, a whole lot of you know car parking, and then a bunch of boats sitting there. That is actually a well-functioning marina, and that's exactly how they were designed. Um, yes, I think there's there's certainly room for some some increased public space. The the marina layout could be improved. Uh, the the overall sort of look and feel of it. Uh, we could do some boardwalks and bits and pieces, maybe a, a cafe. Um, but I think it does get very difficult when you start to look at putting large-scale apartment dwellings uh, <coughs> right in the heart of something that is actually working very well. Cheers, Paul. Councillor Walker. Sure. Um, just got a question around the issue you raised that goes to reverse uh, sensitivity. When, when your boat was um, water blasted on the ramp, was that um, under the control of the marina operation or, or the like? Uh, so it's it's I just use a service agent to up this. I'm not I'm not entirely sure how the process works, um, but it is it is very industrial and um, very noisy. Okay. The the reason I raise that is if, as you point out, the boats have got anti fouling on them, any water blasting <coughs> on the ramp is going to be going directly into the marine environment, and I don't know uh, what controls we've got around that, uh, Mr. Chair, but. Maybe it goes to the pressing need for a marina strategy because there may well be significant adverse uh, sensitivities around these locations that and presently aren't being well managed. Okay. Sorry, the, your question was? Was just around reverse uh, sensitivity and I've established that um, from the answer that there may, may well be an issue there now. Okay. Yep. All good. Okay. Councillor Cooper. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks for your presentation. I don't know if you know West Park or Hobsonville Marina very well because you've just sent your boat up there. But did you know that there's already been apartments on that um, hard stand for over 20 years? A and they are, a and that the also that the travel lift is well north, way away, right up at the other end, nowhere near um, that hard stand. So, so the, you're quite right where the travel lift is. Uh, so it, it pulled the boat out and it went right down through the whole right. car park all the way down to the entrance of the marina. Um, I just cannot imagine having members of the public... No, I just wondered around. if you knew that there were already apartments there. Uh, there. There is a limited number of apartments there, yes. And when you said 400... That's did you base the, water. Oh, sorry. Oh, OK, that's fine. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. All right, thank you, Paul. That's very good. Very thank concise. you very much. Appreciate that. Thank you. Right, we now will ask Robert uh, Alsop Smith to, to come forward on behalf of the Birth Holders Association, <coughs> Gulf Harbour. Oh, we're going to have June next, are we? Sorry, Mr. Chair. We've had a slight reversal in our order, so uh, I apologise right. for that. Okay, whatever works best. Okay, June, thank you please you. introduce yourself. Um, well. <coughs> I'm June Kearney. I'm representing West Harbour residents and ratepayers today. Um, and also the Birth Holders Association for Hobsonville, which if you'll forgive me, I'll refer to as West Park, which makes more sense, um, as the chair of the Birth Holders Association is out of the country at the moment. <clears throat> so thank you to the chair and the committee for giving us the opportunity today. My apologies, there's been a limited time to prepare, but it was not expected that the planning committee recommendation would be addressed today. Um, we fully and enthusiastically support that recommendation and commend it to this committee for all marinas, but West Park in particular for us, as this marina was intended for disposal by Panuku in late 2017, under confidentiality, and without discovery would have already been lost to the region. <clears throat> that was put forward to the Upper Harbour Local Board in October 2017 for disposal. We fully, uh, in particular, with West Park, not only because there's been a determination by Panuku that the Hobsonville Marina Limited should acquire the freehold, but for the reason that the unitary plan for West Park is excessively permissive in allowing multi-storey residential development from 18 up to 21 metres above mean sea level, <clears throat> including along the coastal edge. Unlike Bayswater, none of the protections for public access, amenity, parks or any other public good are included in the unitary plan for West Park. <clears throat> we are also aware that both Panuku and Hobsonville Marina Limited had a significant input into the production of the unitary plan for the marina. 
So the effect of the unitary plan for us is an essential component for the scope of the marina strategy. Um, Mr Burson referred to the Empowering Act. Um, certainly that's an issue. It is a New Zealand statute. There is a conflict with the unitary plan and there's no question about that. Um, under section 23 of the RMA, all acts must be taken into account um, when any development or what any other statutory instrument provides. So in that regard, we have an entirely unsatisfactory situation with the three legal opinions in accord, um, our two legal opinions and Panuku's own opinion, that what the unitary plan permits cannot take place under the West Harbour Empowering Act. So it's not surprising that Hobsonville Marina Limited are looking to encourage council to uh, assist them to have that act repealed which will of course be fought vigorously by the public. So empowering acts for marinas are another important factor to recognise in developing the strategy. <clears throat> it is important that the vision the strategy will ultimately define is informed and supported by the relevant statutory instruments. The proposal to build up to 200 five-storey apartments as advertised by Hobsonville Marina at West Park would not only obliterate the coastal edge, but degrade the site as a marine services and recreational resource and an important ferry transport hub. The North West continues to grow at a pace where that hub is invaluable. It is now, and increasingly it will be in the future. In October 2017, the Upper Harbour Local Board resolved to oppose the sale of the marine land at West Park and the development concept and a public engagement conducted jointly by HML and Panuku in June this year. 90% of respondents did not want to see parts of the marina sold for development to private interests and believe the council should retain ownership. <clears throat> Some 400 residents largely from the area submitted feedback <coughs> and a petition with over 500 signatures opposing the sale and calling for a review of the unitary plan was lodged. Marinas are a finite resource and an integral part of Auckland's maritime history, industry, transport and recreation. They provide open space and public coastal access, and they were never intended as housing subdivisions. West Park was devolved at no cost to the people of Waitemata City in 1979 as a boat harbour and a marine asset, protected by the Empowering Act. We commend and support the Planning Committee report which states a new set of principles and criteria may require a relaxation of Panuku's imperative to extract monetary value from these assets in exchange for broader community and other outcomes. <clears throat> Once sold, marina land cannot be recovered for the many uses and services only marinas can provide and for us the best protection is for these to remain in council ownership. My last sentence. When the strategy process is commenced by Council, we look forward to participation and full support for a regional review of these legacy assets, which are central to the livability and the image of the City of Sales. So thank you for hearing us today. Thank you, Jan. Very concise. Thank you. We have Councillor Wayne Walker and then Councillor Watson. Sure. Um, I've just got a, two questions. a fairly simple question that goes to the unitary plan process. Are you familiar with the advice from the planner Robert Scott recommending against a change to residential zoning and that advice was to go to the independent commissioners and council. Are you familiar with that advice? I'm very familiar with Robert Scott's advice. Um, it is an excellent piece of work done by council's own um, commissioned consultant. Uh, Mr Scott also did um, consulting for Pine Harbour and for Gulf Harbour. Great. Um, his evidence for West Park was withdrawn before it went before the independent hearings panel um, at the request of Hobsonville Marina Limited and Panuku, collectively I understand, um, and eventually the, just the explanation I have been given by planning staff is that that was because of natural justice as some of Mr Scott's evidence for West Park was out of scope. A great deal of evidence for Pine Harbour and Gulf Harbour was similarly out of scope, mm. but those, that, that evidence was not withdrawn. So when the matter went to the independent hearings panel, Council 
um, for council, pointed out the issues, but he was unsupported by any planning evidence, and that point was made to the Independent Hearings Panel. <coughs> so there was no evidence that went forward by and, Mr Scott. And as a, as a planner on the uh, Unity Plan, I didn't see that evidence either. Um, so I just want to put that on the record. Thank you, Mr Chair. That is not a question, Councillor Watson. Let it by. Well, I Captain could have phrased it as a question. As Councillor Watson. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, um, just in terms of that evidence that you just mentioned there, was there any mention that there's an empowering act that governs what can and cannot happen at West Park and, and as far as the boat harbour clauses goes, was reinforced by court, High Court decision in 2010? Was there any reference to the Empowering Act itself? No, there wasn't. There was no reference to the Empowering Act in, in that evidence, um, nor, it seems, has it been taken into account in the unitary plan, other than to rely on Section 23 of the RMA, which requires that every other Act um, must be taken into account. OK, thanks. So, sorry, just, just the question I, I really wanted to ask, uh, Mr Chair, uh, we've had comment about the birth holders. June, you're, you're a bit different here. You represent uh, the, the uh, West Harbour Hobsonville Ratepayers Group. You're, you're chair of that group. We've heard that it's you know a, you know a kind of smallish group of disaffected birth holders that are the opposition here. You mentioned about the public feedback, 90% opposition. You reflected about the petition. I think that your group ran. What does that say to you about the public view of the proposal that was put up at, at West Park? Well, clearly for, I mean, I've lived in West Harbour for 20, some 27, 28 years, and West Harbour was built around the marina. It's an integral part, it's the heart of West Harbour, basically. Um, it's not surprising that people have a sense of ownership of that marina. Um, the streets are relevantly named to a marine precinct, and I'm not at all surprised, apart from the fact that one important issue in Robert Scott's evidence was about there being no account taken whatsoever of the impact on the surrounding built environment. And obviously, for people who have built their homes, not expecting to have a five-storey building put in front of them relatively closely, it's a major issue. I can assure you it doesn't affect me personally, um, but it's... Certainly, it does affect a lot of people. It's the amenity not only for residents that are affected, but the amenity of the entire area. Councillor okay, Newman. Yeah, thank you, June, for your reflection on the topic 081D um, hearing on the unitary plan. My question for you is uh, would it be your Would it be your expectation that the only way short of the repeal of the Empowering Act would be to try and use the Public Works Act? And if so, are you aware of any situation whereby the Public Works Act has ever been used to require land for the purpose of building waterfront apartments? Uh, certainly not. Um, we've been fortunate to have a community which has supported two legal opinions that we have. Uh, one in particular has addressed that issue of the suggestion by Panuku. Panuku has its own legal opinion, which also is an accord that this cannot take place under the Empowering Act, and their legal opinion sought ways that could be circumvented. One suggestion was by council taking the land from itself uh, to, under the Public Works Act, to build apartments. No, we have fairly categorical advice that that's not possible. Thank you. Councillor Bartley. Oh, thank you, Mr Chair, and through you. Um, it's good to meet you, June, after receiving your emails. Um, on the site visit to West Harbour, the West Harbour one, there are already apartments there. So um, what, what, do you, what do you say about those? You know, how did that even happen if we had the Empowering Act? A lot of people asked that question way back. Um, some time ago, in the days of Waitakere City. Um, the apartments that are referred to on the car park were never intended to be apartments. They were initially, way back in the 80s, intended to be a boat club. 
The organisation that set up to build the West Park Boat Club unfortunately ran out of money by the time the um, framework had been erected for a wonderful boat club, restaurant, so on, to support the marina. Um, the framework sat there for several years. I seem to recall in my dotage turning the spade for it somehow, back in my former local government days. And it sat there for many years until someone came up with a proposal to take it over and to convert it into apartments and a restaurant on the lower floor and some facilities to service the marina. I don't think I'll, I can't recall the decision making around it, but it happened. And also, as you drive down to the marina, there are apartments on the right hand side, which were part of what I believe was some complex negotiation to include that in that development. And I'm not quite sure how, I'm sorry, I can't recall. Mm. But it was never intended to be apartments there, and it's my understanding that that particular building is actually on freehold already. You might call it a historic aberration. It's quite ugly, actually. Yeah. It is. It looks kind of dead right. down there. Thank you, Jane. Um, yeah. Councillor Walker, very quick follow-up. Sure. Uh, just a very quick follow-up um, just around that mention you made of um, Robert Scott and no account uh, of the impact on the existing built environment. Is it, is it uh, true that the houses in the <coughs> catchment overlooking the marina all have a, a private covenant on them to protect the amenity of the view? Yes, they do. And while it's not a council, it's not a local government covenant, um, it was a very strong covenant as part of the right to subdivide. <coughs> And a lot of people are very bound by those covenants not to block the view of the person in front of them. Um, it's often meant excessive cost to achieve that. Um, and yet, here is a unitary plan which provides basically for all of those rights <coughs> to be taken away. Thank you, Mr Chair. Thank you, Jane. Thank, Thank you very much. Good to see you again and hear from you. Thank you very much. Now, now, we're not quite sure who's next now, because we've got a... Robert. Robert, Robert is it? We're back to Robert. OK. Welcome, Robert. Birth Holders uh, Association, Gulf Harbour. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to address you today. I'm Robert Allsop-Smith, currently president of the Gulf Harbour Birth Holder Association. Firstly, I would totally support the two resolutions Council recently passed being to halt all potential council-owned marina land sales for the time being, and secondly, to develop an Auckland-wide regional marina strategy before any more sales are considered. Given council's mantra that to champion, sorry, championing engaged, open and innovative democracy and decision-making for the diverse communities of Tamaki Macaurau, Development of this strategy is the only logical course of action to address this land sale issue. As long as that strategy formation involves all stakeholders, and clearly marina birth holders are very much a part of that mix. It should be remembered that marinas in private ownership were purchased by the current owners as operating marinas. They were not purchased as development sites. Marinas are unique in their function and purpose. They are few and far between. They are strategic assets of Auckland, as most have transport infrastructure attached. They will be very hard to establish in the future as demand grows. They serve a useful purpose consistent with Council's aims regarding placemaking while the Council remains sorry, while the land remains in council ownership. Turning to Gulf Harbour Marina specifically, I would make the following points. There's no rush to resolve issues at Gulf Harbour. The prob so-called problem has existed for many years. There is no connection between the hammerhead issue and the land sale option, other than the owner applying leverage that does not exist. There are other options to resolving the hammerhead issue which are far more appropriate to apply in this instance. 
sale of marina land would see council lose control regarding the planning and consents process, as is evidenced by what has occurred at Pine Harbour. The current council planning controls do not work or can be too easily manipulated. Demand for haul out space for maintenance is ever increasing with the reductions occurring within the city. Selling the land, thereby extingu extinguishing the development licenses could have catastrophic outcomes. Back to the general in closing. I note that Councillor Hulse was quoted over the weekend as indicating that Council would have to look at divesting itself of some golf courses due to the cost to ratepayers in the hundreds of millions of dollars no. in maintaining those. No, no, she didn't say that. Wrong. <coughs> That's the way it was reported, I'm sorry. <coughs> Marina's cost councils nothing. Most were given to council in trust by empowering acts. They all return council a very healthy annual return. Why would council want to give that up? I could go on in far more detail regarding the reasons for being strongly opposed to council selling off its land interests in marinas and am willing to do so. For now, I would reiterate that the Gulf Harbour Birthholders Association strongly supports the council's intention to develop a regional marina-based strategy so that everyone as stakeholders will know and understand what is expected. We look forward to being a part of that strategy formation process. Thank you. We're not selling gold. Thank you, Robert. <coughs> right, we have Councillor Walker. Thank you, Mr Walker. Chair. Hi, uh, Robert. Um, just so other councillors are uh, familiar with um, uh, Gulf Harbour in terms of the issue, would it be fair to say that the Hammerhead land, where the, um, the ferry berths and, and you've got the boat launching and recreational uses, at capacity now for parking, uh, especially at peak times? It's been past capacity for several years now, uh, Councillor Walker, yeah. Okay. Um, so the follow-on question, uh, given that Council owns the marina land, if at some time in the future there was a need for additional land for parking associated with boat launching, ferry use, recreational use, would not that marina land be the logical place to extend? Um, interesting you raise that question because Panuku did engage in what they referred to as an engagement process, and I'll use that term very loosely. Um, at one of those representations, future Auckland transport use of Hammerhead and Marina land for car parking uh, was discussed. And while we have no, con as Birth Holders Association, we have no <coughs> control over the car park land, the offer was put to Panuku that it made absolute sense that during the weekdays when the marina car parking is not at maximum capacity, it would be sensible for Auckland Transport to have access to part, if not all, of the marina car parks for their um, ferry service. The only potential fishhook in, in that argument is that Auckland Transport does intend, or indicated they have intentions of extending the service to Gulf Harbour and operating a weekend um, ferry service. Uh, fer weekend ferry service with weekend marina activity may cause a conflict, but um, in the, to answer your question, in the big picture, yes, there is land that I'm sure with cooperation of the birth holders and clearly the marina company would have to be involved. Um, I see no reason why it couldn't be dual usage. Okay, thank you. And one other quick question. Uh, the uh, operator that we're dealing with at um, Gulf Harbour, Gulf Harbour Investments Limited, um, Jim Speedy, is that the same um, operator that in the past sought to have 300 apartments on the, the Hammerhead? Yeah, that, that's, this is one of the things that, yes, to answer your question, thank you. as a single, single quest, answer question, but um, this is one of the things that creates the confusion in all of us. Um, only last year, 
uh, Mr. Speedy was trying to have the unitary plan amended, covering the land within the marina. Um, yes, he wanted to put 300 odd apartments up on the Hammerhead, operating them as a lease owner of the land. Um, as soon as there was any resistance to the proposal of the rest of the marina land being freeholded to GHIL, um, all of a sudden Mr Speedy says that as a less, lessee, he is not interested in doing any more development within the marina. Um, the two seem totally incompatible. On one hand, as lessee, you're happy to put up apartments, but on the other hand, as lessee of the marina, you, you're not happy to uh, do any development within the marina. Thank you, Mr Chair. Right, we have Councillor Watson. So, yeah. uh, th thank you, Robert. And, and um, just once again, trying to get a, a sense of, of, of how the community has responded to the proposals put up thus far. Um, Gulf Harbour, Army Bay, Fonga Praia have been uh, involved with this marina for the best part of two decades, highly politicised and formed debates. You went to the public engagement sessions, I understand, which were very well attended. Uh, my understanding was there were two uh, pieces of feedback. Uh, one went to the proposed sale of the marina f out of council ownership, and the other went to the potential uh, means by which um, the Hammerhead and all the public good outcomes could be achieved. A are you able to provide any comment on that? Uh, yes, at the Panuku engagement <coughs> sessions, there were three of them held, which were extremely extremely poorly advertised, um, but that's by the by. They were very well attended. Um, there was one, they were proposals that were put forward. They weren't even options for discussion. One proposal was that um, the hammerhead was to be surrendered by GH, sorry, the hammerhead, right to lease the hammerhead was to be surrendered by GHIL to council. And that proposal was rejected by all three engagement sessions unanimously because the fish hook in it was that the second part of the deal was that the remaining marina land was to be freeholded to GHIL and that proposal was also rejected unanimously by all three meetings. Thank you. Right, last, uh, last question, uh, Councillor Sayers. Oh, thank you, Mr Chair. I was just picking up on that previous answer about, those, uh, about the public meetings being very well attended. I just wanted to get a feel for uh, the number of people that, that did make it there, even though it wasn't particularly well advertised. Uh, there, there was something in the vicinity of 300-odd people at each of the meetings, uh, <coughs> Mr Sayers. Right, thank you. Thank Which you. I, I personally I believe is, is very poor, but it was the level of advertising that produced that result. And I personally don't believe it was any accident that that's what happened. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Newman, to wrap it up. What's please? your understanding of the value of the Hammerhead land and what's your understanding of the value of the, of the balance of land as part of that deal? So, sorry, could I repeat okay. that? Could you repeat that? What was your understanding of the value of the Hammerhead land and what was your understanding of the value of the balance of the land that was having to do? Oh, sorry. Um, the only figures we have are about five or six years out of... Sorry, the first... To answer your first part of the question, the only figures we have to answer the first part of your question is that Panuku's value placed on the right to purchase for council to purchase the right to lease from Mr Speedy of the Hammerhead yep. was in the vicinity of $298,000. Yep. Panuku's value currently that they are placing on the marina land which Mr Speedy would purchase was 9.76 million. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yep. Sweetheart deal of all time. Pretty good. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Robert. That was uh, very good. Right, we're down to the last two, which is um, Ewan. Is Ewan coming forward for West Devon? 
I remember, councillors, we really, uh, I mean, I could keep it tighter with your questions, but I'm asking you to think about keeping it tight. We don't want to get into too much detail, so it is clause B we are talking B about. Right, Thank you, welcome. Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm Ewan Little. I'm from the or West Haven Marina Users Association, and I'm chair of that organisation, and I'm deputy chair of the Auckland Marina Users Association. So I'd just like to say that at West Haven, we're really excited at this opportunity afforded by Council's Planning Committee to be involved as, pa as part of a region-wide marina strategy and to take all marinas in Auckland into account rather than just two or three or six or a couple of them at a time. Um, at West Haven, we see marinas as being a community asset, and as such, we've recently altered our cons constitution to better involve all stakeholders in the West Haven precinct. So we're working closely with the yacht and boat clubs on the northern reclamation at West Haven, the St Mary's Bay Residents Association, along with Mana Whenua, the marine industry, commercial operators, plus walker and stand-up paddleboarders. And we're also um, investigating moving in with the co involving council and community services area um, to establish a group of real stakeholders in the West Haven precinct because we are interested in social, environment and economic values which compromise the public good. In conjunction with Council over the past few years there has been uh, an extension in community access to West Haven which we have enjoyed. There are pathways, walkways, um, all sorts of things that make the precinct available to whoever wants to be there and it is also uh, made more viable the smaller businesses um, that operate out of there with the extra turnout of the increased public patronage of the area. At the marina operating level with Panuku and the West Haven Marina Limited operation they have, we have a, um, we have a working relationship, um, we are able to fight with them on a regular basis and we have good and meaningful discussions. Um, with Panuku itself they tend to treat West Haven Marina as a cash cow. In their own statement of intent, marinas are listed down with quarries, landfills and holiday campgrounds. And that's how they see us. Apart from the fact that um, of the asset base of Panuku, we're the second largest at $65 million. Um, and the income from marinas is the second highest revenue of the marinas around Auckland. And we decided to form the Mar Auckland Marina user uh, situation with all marinas in Auckland. And it's down to June's diligence <coughs> and tenacity, which has given us access to quite a lot of information, which shows how Panuku act, how they intend to act, and what their planning is. And they're quite embarrassed about it because we keep talking to them about it at the moment as we're going through the days now. And it's abundantly clear that Panuku, along with a couple of selected developers, has several plans to overturn all of the state legisl legislature which protects marinas and the marina environment. And it hints our pleasure that the council is walking council prepared to embrace differing views on what the strategy should be for marinas and to involve every marina in the Auckland district. And from our own point of view, we're talking about all those walker paddlers, stand up paddle boarders. We've got dry stack marinas. We've got guys with, uh, we've got a big boat ramp operating in West Haven where a lot of people come in and launch their boats and park their trailers as well. Um, we think it's great that we can get all these people involved and let us all know what a definition of a strategy and what a scope for the Auckland Council strategy should be. So we are really looking forward to it. And we'd ask that you guys go along with the decision made at your planning committee and stay with putting together a viable, complete marina strategy for Auckland. Thank you. Right. Um, Richard, do you want to, I know you've come forward, do you want to present now or? No, no, I was just, just trying to save you a little bit of time by coming forward now. Oh, OK. So, sorry, you're not going to speak. I will, I will speak. Oh, I just said okay, we came right. forward now to okay, speed right up on. the process. Right. Any questions of, of Ewan? Well said. Well said. Oh, thank you. Well, okay. just, just, just sorry, just one very quick one, Ewan. Thank you. I mean, just in light in your, of your comments about who should be... Um, say leading out on this strategy given the, the background to date, um, do, do you believe then that that's a strategy that, 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 that council should be running say perhaps as, as opposed to Panuku? Uh, absolutely, 100%. Right, Ewan, thank you very much. Thank you. A very good presentation and we're now down uh, with almost an hour, so Richard yep, uh, okay. to Last presentation from the Auckland Marina Users Association. 
Um, thank you. Good morning, uh, Chair, uh, Mayor, Phil Goff, um, Councillors, and members of the Independent Maori Statutory Board. Um, also, our thanks for the opportunity to speak today. Um, and equally delighted by the um, recommendations that came out of the planning committee two weeks ago. Um, and thanks also due to um, Chris Darby for steering that through the lengthy discussion in the afternoon to get to that point. Um, we also appre fully appreciated the Mayor's support, uh, strong support for the resolutions that came out of that meeting. Um, it's our earnest hope that this committee does endorse those recommendations. And I'd just like to put three, um, what I hope are reasonably compelling arguments as to why you should stop the sales and commit to that strategy. Um, I've circulated beforehand just a little mind map again of mine, which you should have in front of you. Um, an issue for this committee will, of course, be what return do you get on an asset like marinas? And I did a little bit of digging um, just yesterday. Ports of Auckland, currently your shares there or your interest in Ports of Auckland currently returns about 4.5%. Auckland International Airport, about 4.22. Those are on um, share market prices yesterday. Marinas, um, there's a limited amount of information that we can get at because of the ownership structures. And we are doing some further checking, but we <coughs> used as an could use as an example the car parks at Gulf Harbour Marina, which we talked about a little earlier on. If you actually look at the return on ground rent to council, that currently, or in the last financial year by our estimate, sits at 6.9%. And for the financial year 18-19, Gulf Harbour Marina Management Limited increased the provision for ground rent by a factor of two on the understanding that those rates were going to be increased by Panuka, which would return 14.6% per annum. So it seems to me that uh, maybe the council should <coughs> consider selling its shares in Ports of Auckland and Auckland <laughs> International Airport and buy some more marinas. Oh my um, but it just calls into question the importance in the strategy of looking at the commercial arrangements and the commercial value and the economic value to the community of Auckland. I'd like to turn to legacy outcomes. Um, I was quite enthusiastic two weeks ago about the potential outcomes for, for marina strategy in Auckland, and I would like to reiterate that. It's a great opportunity to secure the future for future marina needs to meet the needs for growth in recreational use. We have a growing population, there's a growing demand. It can often only be satisfied at marinas because of the nature of that demand. And there are other options other than for sale to secure public transport operations. The most important aspect probably to come out of as a legacy option, a legacy outcome, is really the opportunity to protect strategic options for the future. Not all of the demand and not all of the funding will be available now. But if the strategy does not address future demand and protect it, it will not be available. That, to me, is a compelling reason to halt the sales now. Another key issue that has come up a number of times relates to the Auckland Unitary Plan, and I believe there are some flaws in that, no matter what process took place to get to it. And I think one of them does relate to coastal inundation and the risks associated with that. If you look at coastal inundation risk at marinas, Virtually all of the land that is in question so far that's been talked about for sale falls within the coastal hazard areas. And there are requirements under the New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement to restrict the development in such zones so that you do not increase the risk for people and the economy of New Zealand. And finally, recreational demand we've talked about um, growing population, growing demand, opportunity to in intensify recreational use of our marinas and the fact that it's scarce. And I'll just close by making, reading one comment, and this came from a Panuku report. Um, it's on marina berth supply and demand trends, and it was April this year. And it says, the Auckland market is expected to continue to experience <coughs> strong demand for marina berths consistent with international trends but limited supply due to the increasingly difficult, increasing difficulty in gaining consent for new marina facilities. 
on sensitive coastal land under the Resource Management Act and other legislation. The limited supply of new marina burrs means that existing marinas in Auckland need to optimise the utilisation of their facilities to meet growing demand and respond to the local and international trends discussed in this report, including increasing vessel lengths, gross in multi-hull vessels, liverboard facilities, more powered vessels, alternative land-based storage options for smaller vessels. I think there's some compelling reasons to endorse the recommendations before this committee that came from the planning committee. Um, and I would also endorse the willingness and keenness of the Auckland Marina Users Association to be involved in both scoping and in the process of developing that strategy. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Right. Surprise, surprise. Councillor Walker. Yeah, a um, couple of quick um, uh, questions. Um, just around the marinas in general, um, as it stands now, West Haven is a strategic asset. Would you consider that the network of marinas across the region, uh, say akin to the roading network, which is a strategic asset, is a strategic asset, and that that could and should be considered as part of the scope of this study? Um, I certainly do. I, I find it difficult to understand why marinas would not be considered as key strategic assets. Um, there was a letter from Panuku to the Gulf Harbour Berth Holders Association which identified the marina as being strategically important um, but not of significance and I found that a little bit of an odd statement. And the other uh, question just goes to the difference in um, treatment between let's say everything else uh, across the uh, marina area in Auckland as compared to the Viaduct Harbour <coughs> Winyard Point, West Haven area, mm. where there is a policy not to sell, not to sell uh, land, which of course has enabled us to host the America's Cup, as compared to the lack of a policy elsewhere across our marina assets, where effectively they're going to be flogged off. Well, that's been the proposal on the part of Panuku. I'd just invite your comment on that. Um, <coughs> sorry, I've lost the thread of your question. <laughs> so, so, so I guess, um, why should there be a difference between how we're treating the marina land around the waterfront as compared to the marina land around the balance of the region in terms of sale? Can I please jump in on that? The, um, there's been a lot of talk about the unitary plan, and in the unitary plan, Panuka and Council figured that they would convert every marina to a precinct and therefore that would enable them to overcome the um, difficulty of the Empowerment Act. At West Haven, we discovered that they were doing that, and we spent $60,000 on lawyers' fees to submit to the independent hearing panel, and they came out in our favour and said that whilst uh, West Haven was very close to the city, it was not a precinct and it was a standalone marina. And from that, uh, or part of that, plus when the council bought... West Haven from the Helen Clark government at the end of the port company and before ports of Auckland, um, there was a set of covenants um, encumbering council about what they could do at West Haven. So in spite of all that, I understand that Panuku do have plans to do some uh, development work in West Haven anyway, um, and so we will be countering that when it rears its ugly head. But I think that helps to explain why West Haven's been treated separately because we beat out the unitary plan drive to cons include all marinas as precincts. Thank you, Mr Chair. Right, I think to wrap it up is Councillor Watson. Uh, thank, you, thank you, Mr Chair, uh, and, and thank you, Richard. Just, just one quick question. It's been a pretty consistent theme of people uh, requesting that this strategy be um, you know, thorough and comprehensive, um, in effect, um, mirroring the sentiments expressed by the Mayor. Obviously, a consideration for us is, is a cost towards such strategy. Um, you mentioned work you're doing on the return that Council, or Panuku at least, gets essentially for nothing. I, I thought in Gulf Harbour's instance, for instance, it was, was 600 grand a year they were getting. Are you able to make these other um, figures available to us when they come on? Uh, in terms of 
what council's getting from the marinas as a whole. A, a, essentially, for doing nothing, that's like money for jam, is it? <laughs> I, I think it's a good return, but I, um, the returns I quoted there were based on the current capital values of that land as they're quoted in the, uh, on the council website. So I used current capital, capital value at Gulf Harbour for those car parks to determine that return. Um, rather than a, a zero, which is what it cost in the first place. But you have to recognise that, that you know, that's money that's available to work if you want to put it to work, and that's how hard it's working for you now. Um, if we're able to gather more information as we make our own inquiries, we're more than happy to share okay, it. Okay, well, I, I just say that's going to be a practical consideration at, at some point. Sorry, you and could, your If I could add to that, if you went to um, Panuku's um, accounts last year, you would see that they value their marinas at 65 million and that they receive 12 million a year in berth rentals. And I guess yeah. that includes car park rentals as well. So um, there's a roughly 19% return on that investment, yeah. which they didn't have Easy to pay return. for in the first place. Mm. So there's good money in it. There certainly is good money in it. Absolutely. So we should be buying them. Well, well the ones you own, <laughs> you should be running better, I think. <laughs> right. <laughs> Happy to move, uh, Mr. Chair. Happy to second, Mr. Chair. <laughs> right, so we're going to have a vote of thanks for everyone. <laughs> there is uh, no other resolutions. There's no report on this agenda, so therefore, unless someone has tabled beforehand an extraordinary business uh, relating to a new resolution, nothing will happen. So the resolutions in the planning committee hold, and um, uh, we appreciate the consistency of the last five presenters, and we appreciate Empire coming and presenting their point of view, which they didn't at the planning meeting. So thank you very much to all of you. And, um, and so I've got to move in a second. I'll put that. All those in favour? Aye. 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 Against? Obviously no one. Thank you very much to <coughs> all of you. And we will now have a break. It was an hour and a half, so well done. Thank you very much for your time. Excellent. Oh, Ross. There's that second one that says recommended upon it. We're not proceed. There must be a resolution not to proceed, is there? Oh,
Okay, Janet, are you around? Welcome team from High Biscuits and Bays. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, good morning to the Deputy Mayor, and the Mayor's not here at the moment, and councillors. Um, I have with me, I think you all know me, um, Janet Fitzgerald, the Deputy Mayor, and I have with me Chris Bettany, who is a local board member from the East Coast Bay. Kia ora tato. We've come to you today because the resolution of the Hibiscus and Bays Board was that we would endorse the sale of Hiwi, a Hiwi Crescent, but um, we believe that the money obtained for the sale of it should go back into Penlink. And a little bit of history of Penlink itself, the original designation when the land was number of, of the properties was being bought up. Up to Artclough Lane, which is above where Hewi Crescent is, was actually in the original designation of Penlink. And then the widening, road widening projects were set out in separate chunks all the way along Whangapraa Road. And I see one of the arguments here is that it is going to be <coughs> still a live project, the Wongapraa Road widening, but we still believe sincerely, and it was a unanimous decision of the local board, that the three, whatever is obtained in the sale of Penlink, of the Hiwi, a Hiwi Crescent, goes back into the Penlink project. And that's what we're here to today, to ask you to do that, because we don't want it going into just the transport fund. And while it, whatever is obtained from the um, sale is only a small bout in the, in the whole mix of Penlink, it's still money that we believe should go back into the Penlink project. Janet, Councillor Simpson. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, Janet, thank you. Um, when you made this resolution at your board meeting, did any of the staff members give you any barriers as to why what you were suggesting couldn't occur? <coughs> no. <Right. coughs> okay. Further questions of Janet? Councillor Watson. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Janet and Chris. Um, just in terms of of, of Penlink, we, we know it's um, it's I think down for 2025-28 uh, construction period period or thereabouts. Um, is is there work that could be done in uh, in the interim um, along that route? I know, for instance. Uh, the council went for a site visit the other day to, to Waiti and we were told the first two kilometres of the route um, essentially laid out. So I'm assuming there are maybe sort of works that could be proceeding that would be beneficial to, to the kind of long-suffering community that, that this money could be used for. It wouldn't just be um, sort of academic. There is some, some uses that it could be put to in terms of a small progress uh, with, with Penlink, uh, perhaps in terms of, of, of planning or some ancillary works. Would, would that be correct to say that? Yes, you're quite correct. Even though that it's in the plan um, at for 25, 28, 
Um, there is, um, we're hoping that, and the local board have got a resolution that we try to bring Penlink forward. Um, so we believe that money can be spent um, progressing Penlink today. Thank you. Councillor Sayer. <coughs> oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, General, I was just trying to clarify from the local board's perspective where if to ring fence that money, is that, uh, did, does the local board imagine that going into an Auckland Transport um, dedicated line item for for uh, for Penlink, if, if it exists, or does it go into, the, or are you asking for it to go into the local board's capital um, line expenditure budget? Just where, where would you like it um, to be? No, marked? we're happy for it to go to Auckland Transport mm. as long as it's earmarked for Penlink. <coughs> Thank you. Councillor Walker and then Mayor. Sure. Um, so, sure, I'm, I'm certainly familiar with the area of, um, of land and obviously there's a modest amount of money to come from it and, and I understand where you're at around Penlink. Um, mm -hmm. Having said that, um, if we're talking about money being spent in the local area, Whangapura Road doesn't even have footpaths along significant parts of its length. <coughs> I'll repeat that. Whangapura Road, which is the busiest road uh, arguably in the Hibiscus Coast, doesn't even have footpaths along part of its length, or for that matter, um, cycleways, safe um, cycleways. Uh, if, if we're talking about ring fencing for um, transport, uh, I, I guess another option is to ensure that that money is, is spent in the area and maybe spent immediately on, on things that could benefit um, people. Um, is that something that your local board um, considered as, as an option? No, the resolution from the local board is that request at that as the property was originally required for Whangapura Road widening in conjunction with the Penlink project, that the sale proceed should be transferred to the Penlink project budget. Mr. Gannett, Mayor Gough. Uh, thanks very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, um, to the Hibiscus local and Bay's local board for their <coughs> presentation. Um, my question, if I may, Mr Chair, is, is to invite comment from our Chief Financial Officer, um, because clearly the board will understand that um, if we were to introduce a policy of ring fencing, it wouldn't apply in one case, it would, it would apply across many cases, and my concern is that that would create some real complications uh, in terms of how you put money aside, particularly small amounts of money aside, to a much larger project that we intend to fund anyway. But if I could, through you, just ask um, Matthew to make some comments about whether this is possible within our existing policy and the complications that might create, because that was, I think, in answer to uh, Councillor Simpson's comment, something that maybe should have drawn, been drawn to the attention of the board uh, by, by, by uh, board officers. Thank you, Mayor. Um, through the Chair, um, and I guess it's just clarifying and reinforcing, but so the, the transform and unlock policy you have in place at the moment uh, is one of two areas where you've set policies uh, that provide guidelines as to where ring fencing would be appropriate. Um, that's tied into the LTP. There's around 200 million uh, over the 10 year period uh, that's earmarked by way of asset sales in Panuku outside of the Transform and Unlock. Uh, and I guess eight uh, Iwi Crescent would be one of those opportunities of many uh, through time that need to be considered through this committee uh, to contribute to that target of 200 million over the, over the 10 years. But um, as we're not talking here about a Transform and Unlock area, uh, that's what makes this uh, recommendation pretty difficult. Um, the other uh, the other scenario in which uh, some ring fencing would be contemplated would be around a service asset and we you know we use the optimization term but the idea is that there's a project that could uh, make better use of that service asset through redevelopment uh, and the like um, through the chair if I might if I may as well because I understand uh, the local context around uh, the interest in the in the penlink project um, 
and, and it was useful, Jeanette, we had a, had a discussion the other day, and I'm just letting, uh, letting uh, the committee know uh, there is work afoot in transport, uh, and I've got staff supporting that as well, uh, actively looking at how PenLink uh, can occur earlier and how we can accelerate that project. So um, there's work underway there. Uh, it's, it's looking to leverage the existing funding in the plan as well as what we can do uh, with the tolling model, uh, and that's been actively worked at the moment, and I've, I've offered that transport people and perhaps some others can give the local board a briefing over the next four to six weeks on that. All right. Well, um, so councillors, in clause four of the report on page 13, the last sentence there, I'm sure Anthony will, um, will, will come and verify um, how that advice was provided, which is, is, is actually against what um, Janet is saying. So there are no further questions. So thank you very much, Janet. Thank you. Board member and uh, over mover, moved by Councillor Simpson, second by Councillor Watson, and we thank you for your presentation. All those in favour? Aye. 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 No, none, so we go straight on to extraordinary business, which there is none, and therefore we are the disposal recommendation. So, Anthony, please. So, good morning. I take the report as read. Um, I'll just quickly give a, a run through, especially of the other property. Um, so the two properties uh, have been identified as ha not having a, uh, a current or future service use. Um, AT We Crescent, as discussed, um, <laughs> was released by Auckland Transport, not required for the Pongaparoa road widening project. Um, AT have indicated that the road widening uh, will occur on the other side of the road as per um, the transport designation 167 in the unitary plan. Um, it is a property that is subject to offer back obligations to the former owners. Um, we would like to proceed with that. Advice was given informally uh, in terms of, in general, sales proceeds uh, are used by council to fund debt or to fund regional priority projects. Um, it was communicated by local board services, so perhaps that information wasn't sent directly to the local board. I'll follow up that with local board services directly. Um, the other property, uh, 30R Birmingham Crescent, it is a reserve under the Reserves Act. However, you can probably see uh, on the photos it is used as an informal truck and car park by the adjacent businesses. Purchase or inquiry has come through for one of those property owners seeking to acquire it. Um, the property has been assessed uh, by Council's Parks and Open Space Policy Team. Um, it's not required, it's not providing any linkages. It's not identified in the local board's Greenway plan. Um, no interest of cultural significance or commercial interest from me. We have been received, and the Otara Papatoto Local Board endorsed the disposal of uh, 30R Birmingham. Um, so, any questions? Free to, free to answer. Councillor Simpson. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Look, I'm just going to take up that um, point I made before. So, according to the Local Board, they didn't know about the process. So, maybe if we could just look at that process, Anthony, what do you think we could do better to ensure that Local Board have actually all the information so they don't? go down a path of thinking A can happen when actually uh, it can't at all. Through the Chair, I do have all the, the, the three local board reports I sent to the local board in front of me. I don't want to go through them line by line. That information is always included okay, in a local board report. That's all I want to, thank you. Okay. Councillor Walker. Yeah, um, so just in terms of um, uh, Hiwi, Hiwi Crescent, and I appreciate your comment around the, um, the road widening taking place on the, um, on the other side of the, of, of the road. W will this um, sale in any way impact on an efficient and safe cycleway and walkway on the Hiwi Road side of the road? And I would note presently that um, Hiwi Road does give um, more efficient access to surf road in the vicinity as it stands? Uh, through the Chair, I'd have to defer that question to Auckland Transport. I, I can follow it up directly for you, but that's not a problem. So, just, I'd suggest that um, that question be addressed to Auckland Transport, um, Mr Chair, because in the absence of an effective uh, walkway <coughs> and cycleway strategy for certainly the um, Whangaproa, it would be um, useful for or can transport to at least do some forecasting before it sells the land. It will be passed on as to whether it's before it's sold. That's another issue. Councillor Cooper. I 
think that was um, one of my questions because I just need to be reminded, is this now <coughs> an NZTA funded project or AT or a bit of both? Penlink. Penlink. Both. Both. Um, so what I would be unsure about if this is sort of several, several years away that we would be giving money to AT to sit there when we've got other more pressing go now projects that which that is already budgeted for. So that, that would be my um, reason I couldn't really support that because it is so far away. But if there's going to be a process where, I mean, if Panuka have looked and asked AT and we go back again and just ask them again to make sure that it's not needed. Um, I mean, I just have to support the fact that we've got a strategy that says we'll refund, we'll put money back into areas of either growth or unlock, transform or unlock, and that's what we agreed to. And when there's a new tranche of growth and <coughs> unlock um, townships, as we have said we will be doing, and I think Papakura is another one we're going to be looking at shortly, um, <coughs> that it comes up, then yes. any proceed of sales will go to that. But I think I feel more comfortable if we stick to our policy. Honest, but I would recommend that we do stick to the policy, councillors. Um, we have amended that target of uh, what we're going to raise through surplus sales down substantially. Um, and we've done okay up to now, but it's now down from, I think it was 970 in total way back. Um, but whatever, uh, it's now down to 200. So it's not as though we're, we're pillaging and, and, uh, and selling uh, willy nilly. We're getting down to really not a lot that's left and, and when you look at things like marinas where we've effectively kicked for touch for a, a period to, to do a more strategic approach to it sensibly um, it we, we are getting down to small parcels of land so um, any further questions of Anthony um, well I'm happy to move these resolutions do we have a seconder no, I'm happy. No. Okay. Councillor Fletcher and Councillor Watson. Oh, yeah, yeah just, um, just very briefly to talk to the item, um, Mr Chair, um, I, I, I acknowledge what the, uh, the Mayor said in, in terms of um, policy and that, that is a, you know, that's a the clear constraint that exists here. But I, I just would say that I think the, the appearance of the High Business and Bays local board members here does signal um, a, a feeling that I've detected amongst a number of local boards where now there's, there is a bit of expectation of, of, of quid pro quo. Uh, clearly that can't happen in, in, in this instance. But to be honest, there does seem to be a, a, you know, a degree of uh, not quite randomness, but um, distinction drawn between some proceeds, service property, non-service property. Uh, and as things become tighter, I would suggest that the notion that you know, there, there should be a return to the local community in some shape or form will, will be um, one that gains uh, some some greater strength. However, when it's all said and done, if we're talking about Penlink, I think Matthew came up with, uh, <laughs> with the, the comment that will meet with the greatest uh, warmth uh, on the High Business Coast, and that is if the project is, uh, timeline is sped up, uh, and that will <coughs> certainly be something that would be greatly appreciated. So uh, in light of the constraints signalled by the Mayor and the policy and hopefully some uh, more positive news in terms of the timeline, um, notwithstanding the fact that uh, this council has reached something of a hallmark in being uh, the first entity to actually secure uh, a funding for this very significant project, then, then that will be very welcome. So um, thank you for that. Thank you, John. Are there any other comments? Um no further questions and no other comments. All right, councillors, we'll put those um, resolutions A and B. All those in favour? Aye. 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 And against? No. That's unanimous. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Anthony and team. And thank you, Janet and team. Um, okay, we are now to the Finance um, Performance Committee information report. Um, I think that's moved by Councillor. Simpson and I will second. Um, any further discussion on that? Given that this main discussion is in, in um, a closed shop. So we'll put those recommendations, put that recommendation, all those in favour? Aye. Thanks. Thank you very much. And there's no extraordinary items that have been signalled, so we're going to move to public exclu excluded if we could arrange that.